Oye, oye, oye. Anyone having business for the King's Justice of the Superior Court of Justice, attend now and you shall be heard. Long live the King. The Honorable Justice Hennessy presiding. Please be seated. Good morning, all. Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Hong. I have two questions, which I don't know if they should go to Ms. Barkley or not. I'll just tell you what the questions are and you can tell me if, where is she? Oh, there she is. And you can tell me if uh, they're better for whomever on your team. Um, with, um, uh, maybe these are not yours, Ms. Barkley, because I don't think you addressed the, the duties flowing from the honor of the crown, but will those, do those go to someone else on the team? Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm good. I didn't have my list last night when I had this idea. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hong. And you are on calculation of nominal NCRRs. That's correct, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Stage three has been a long journey. Appreciate the opportunity to appear before the court one more time. As you've indicated, I will be addressing the sole issue of calculating nominal NCRRs. We've handed out a compendium uh, of Her Ma His Majesty the King and Right of Ontario, and it's labeled volume two of four. Should have a copy in hand up to you now. Thank you. You can mark this as a lettered exhibit. It's, I don't, it's the next letters. Exhibit NN. NN. Thank you. Ontario Compendium. So you've called it just on the title page, volume two, but this is on calculation of NCRRs? That's correct. Thank you. In addition to that, I may be referring to the reply closing submissions of the plaintiffs, Red Rock and White Sand First Nations. So it may be handy to have a copy of that in front of you. I will get that. Sorry, you said reply of the plaintiffs? That's correct. Okay. And I may be referring to the oral closing submissions of the plaintiff, it's marked exhibit I, I. The uh, compendium. Oh, the compendium. It has uh, 20 tabs. Distinguished by its 20 tabs. <laughs> They're all the same color, so I couldn't think of it. Oh, got it, thank you. Okay, uh, the NCRRs are addressed in Ontario's main submissions at part 2.iib, and that's paragraphs 177 to 206. And part 2e of our reply submissions at paragraphs 103 to 120. For NCRRs, Ontario relies on the evidence of its economic experts, Professors Robin Bodeway, Professor Michael Smart, and Cliff Hamill. As noted by Ms. Evans earlier this week, both Professors Bodeway and Professor Smart have notable credentials and accomplishments. Professor Bodeway, a recipient of the Order of Canada, has a highly distinguished career his field of research is public finance. Likewise, Professor Smart, who made his very first attendance in the court of law, also carries a highly distinguished career. 
His specialty is public finance. Mr. Hamill, highly accomplished in his own right, was the only electricity expert who testified in the trial. And in my opinion, having one of the most interesting backgrounds for the witnesses, having worked on nuclear submarine reactors. Very cool. <laughs> there are points for that. <laughs> now, just as a summary, Professors Boldway and Smart estimated the cumulative present value of NCRs between 1850 and 2020 for the RST territory to be a loss of $4.2 billion. In contrast, Mr. Hutchings estimated his present value of his NCRRs to be a gain of 56.9 billion. Now, Ontario recognizes that the task of putting together 170 plus years of Crown resource revenues and expenses was an extremely challenging and complicated one. All of the economic experts were faced with an incredible amount of data and financial documents. The court's task is equally daunting. Having to sort through the evidence presented and determine what to rely upon in your decision. I don't intend to focus my limited time here on giving my personal impressions of the various witness testimonies or trying to respond to every single issue raised. That would not be efficient. <clears throat> what I believe would be helpful to the court is to take a look at some of the key differences between the approaches taken by the economic experts with some selected examples. I hope this will assist the court in its task of evaluating and weighing the evidence on an issue by issue basis to reach a fair and just result. In doing so, I hope to not just demonstrate the differences in approaches, but at the same time address some of what we say are unfair characterizations of the evidence as errors of Professor Bodeway and Professor Smart. Ultimately, Ontario submits that a careful look at the evidence will show that the approaches taken by Professors Bodeway and Smart were principled, logical, and satisfied the provisions of the Court of Appeal order. It will also show that caution should be taken in accepting some of the approaches of the plaintiff's experts, especially in regards to some extraordinary decisions, decisions taken on Crown expenses. Just as a roadmap, I will first address some commonalities of approaches between the experts And then I will address distinctions between the approaches of the experts between the, of Ontario and the plaintiffs in two key areas. The first area is the use and reliance on data. And there I will address three examples. Mining profit tax, 1935. hydro expenses and post-1945 expenses. Sorry, uh, first you're going to commonalities. Yes. And then the uh, distinctions. The distinctions on these three. The first group is the use of data and the three examples I would use would be the MPT 35, hydro expenses and post-1945 expenses. And the second distinction 
will be how the experts determine relevant revenues and expenses. And if I have some leftover time, some additional remarks. <clears throat> I'll first start with the commonality to approaches. There were a number of commonalities in the approaches to NCRRs by the economic experts. I don't intend to recite them all here but here are some relevant ones. The Ontario and plaintiff experts follow the same broad steps to calculate apportionment of revenue and expense figures. For the most part, they work with provincial wide figures for revenues and expenses. Then they apportion these province wide figures down to the applicable RST share. Let me just catch up for one second. Of course. Go ahead. If you look at Ontario's compendium, volume two of four, at tab one, page one. This is a slide from Exhibit 70, demonstrative of Michael Smart. And I just wanted to draw the court's attention to the, I guess I'll call it a flow chart. They indicated a commonality of approach between the experts of taking province-wide figures and then portioning them down to RST revenues. RST expenses, and from those two amounts, calculating uh, the net crown revenues. As plaintiff's counsel indicated last week, these calculation, calculations are best described as estimates. These are not precise numbers. Precision is impossible in this task. The RST territory was agreed to for the purposes of, cal purposes of calculating past compensation. And the experts endeavored to exclude revenues and expenses that fell outside the agreed upon territory. I will now address the first of the two critical differences in the approaches taken by the Ontario and plaintiffs experts. And that is the use and reliance on data. And this is addressed at paragraphs 108 to 113 of Ontario reply submissions. Go ahead. Simply put, professors Boldway and Smart put a heavy reliance on using actual data and the plaintiff experts, much less so. But to start, we need to clear up the plaintiff's repeated misstating of this principle applied by professors Bodeway and Smart. When you say of this principle or of this approach? Yes. In the written submissions at paragraphs 502E, when I say they, I meant the red rock, white sand plaintiffs. Yeah. <clears throat> and in oral submissions, the group of five plaintiffs complain that Bodeway and Smart slavishly treated the PAOs as sacrosanct. 
In oral submissions, they even tried to characterize this principle as equating the PAOs as a Bible of some sort. This is misleading. Wasn't that um, Professor Smart's word? Which Bible? Uh, but not for the PAOs. So I'm going to explain. Oh, wasn't it? All right. I'll take you to the principle. The actual principle being applied by Boldway and Smart was stated at Exhibit 70, page 38. And you will find that at tab two, slide two. It's the third bullet on this page and it's highlighted. <clears throat> the principle is in economic analysis, data are sacrosanct. We cannot substitute invented data for the PAO data when it suits our purposes. That's the principle, that's the approach. So you say it's a misstatement for the plaintiffs to say they treated the PAO data as sacrosanct. Right, it's data and with the clarification, we cannot substitute invented data for the PAO data when it suits our purposes. Just don't want any I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not seeing the difference, but go ahead. The evidence showed that where there was available data, Boldway and Smart were strongly hesitant to invent numbers to replace it. There is nothing slavish or improper about this approach. In fact, Professor Bodeway and Smart's approach is a principled one for economic analysis that is logical, prudent, and reasonable. And you don't say that the word invent is somewhat exaggerated. Um, I haven't made a characterization of that, but the concept is clear. When the, you have PAO data, you cannot substitute it with your own. Proxy, proxies or another method, another economist type method. Well, there are different aspects of that, and I'll get to that later, but let's take, for example, when you interpret um, missing data. I, I'm, I'm only uh, pushing you on these things because if you keep setting up the debate as miles apart, it doesn't help me. But if you bring things closer, I, I can start to see it. Okay. So but if you set up a straw house, of course, it's easy to blow down. If you call it invented data, there will be a strong argument. So the key to this principle is the replacement when you have data and it suits your purposes. Okay. So most importantly, we submit that evidence that is based on actual data is more reliable than evidence based on substituted figures. As I've indicated, I will address three examples where the principle was applied by Boldway and Smart and where it was not applied by the plaintiff's experts. But before we go to the examples, I want to pause for a moment to briefly address the public accounts of Ontario, which I will normally call the PAOs. For this litigation, the PAOs are the best and most reliable source of data for crown revenues and expenses. 
all of the economic experts relied on the PAO data for revenues. And Mr. Hutchings relied upon them up until 1945 for expenses. Mr. Hutchings admitted they were reliable for the purposes they were created. And that's from the Hutchings cross exam, February 21st, 2023, day nine at page 1513 to 1514. Last week, the Group of Five Council admitted that they do not challenge the accuracy of the PAOs. And that was on page 53 of the transcripts for September 13th. However, the plaintiffs made two allegations in their submissions that we can take a look at, look at now. If you turn to tab three of the compendium, this is from the plaintiff's main submissions at paragraph 502. And I'm referring to page four of the compendium. So it's 502 sub paragraph E. Do you, do you want me to go to that now? Yes, please. In this paragraph, they are <clears throat> asserting errors. And at E, page four, Your Honor. Page four of the compendium at tab three. Have your compendium? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought you were sending it to the plaintiffs. My apologies. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> and here they assert uh, at E slavishly treating the public accounts as sacrosanct when even they knew that the accounts had to be wrong. There's no evidence that either Professor Smart or Bodway admitted that the accounts were wrong. When counsel for the plaintiffs cross-examined Professor Smart, and I've included a copy of that transcript excerpt at tab four of my compendium. Counsel put to Professor Smart, the proposition, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing, the proposition that if he had applied Mr. Hutchings' methodology, could Mr. Hutchings be correct that there was not sufficient granularity to sort out the expenses in the public accounts of Ontario after 1945? And I'm reading from page six now. Would you agree with that? And Professor Smart answered, I think it could be possible. All right, and this, you take me to this evidence to show me. There was an allegation made by the plaintiffs that, it's a pair of, uh, paragraph 439 of their submissions that smart all but conceded Hutchings' opinion. And I just want to clarify 
all he answered was, it could be possible. And that is not a concession of that nature. Professor Smart did not do the exercise of Mr. Hutchins methodology, nor did Mr. Hutchins did Professor Smart's and Professor Bodway's methodology. It could be possible, it might not be. There's nothing more you can take from that. So I'm not sure exactly, just tell me, he did not concede that the Hutchings approach was valid? No, he did not concede that if he applied the Hutchings approach, that the PAOs would not have sufficient granularity to sort out the expenses after 1945. Oh, once that's cleared up, I want to turn to my first example. And what I plan to do was, will be to first identify the example. I will this is an example of the use and reliance on data. Right. And it's an example of what in the use and reliance on data? Um, how did experts approach that? Uh, okay. So my plan is to first identify the example, summarize some evidence on it, and then submit what we think are the takeaways. That's kind of the organization I hope to follow. Okay. And the first one is the mining profit tax, 1935. This is addressed at paragraph 113 of Ontario reply submissions, as well as the nominal values report of professors Bodeway and Smart, which is exhibit 60, section 7.1, and the serve reply to Hutchings exhibit 63 at paragraphs 50 to 51. If you turn to tab five of Ontario's compendium, you see the same slide we just took a look at, and he is actually referring, um, Professor Smart in his demonstrative here, is referring to the MPT revenues, 1935. And just as a reminder, the issue was that Professors Bodeway and Smart recorded no revenue for MPT 1935, and Mr. Hutchins did. In his testimony, Professor Smart explained that there was a change in the fiscal year end in 1935, resulting in the shortened year. He demonstrated on page 39 of his demonstrative, which is page eight of the compendium. It's the next page. That there was no revenue list booked to the PAOs for profit tax for 1935. And you can also see for the 1936 year, there was a profit tax of one point, approximately $1.4 million. During his testimony in response to a question by this court, he explained how the MPT was paid in October of each year. So I just oh. want to make sure that, that I have properly described this. 
Yes. Page eight is page 39 of exhibit 70, which is um, Professor Smart's demonstrative. Professor Smart's demonstratives. Thank you. So it's the smart evidence to the chip that we're looking at. That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Smart ex explained to the court that the MPT was paid in October of each year and it still is today. And that was at day 34, transcripts, May 17, pages 5978 to 5979. He also explained that the MPT would have been paid in October of 1934 and October 1935. Thereby, providing an explanation why there wasn't a second payment for those few months booked for the 1935 fiscal year. And this corresponds to the accounts that we see in front of us. And we say is a reasonable explanation as to why taxpayers did not pay twice in the same calendar year. As a result, professors Bodeway and Smart used the PAO data, which is zero, for 1935 MPT in their NCRR accounts. In contrast, Mr. Hutchins sees no MPT booked for the 1935 year and decided there should be. He inputs a figure to add in as revenues using the years preceding and following it to calculate. This became an area of disagreement between the experts. And when presented with it, if you turn to tab six of the Ontario Compendium, could you remind me of the import of this difference? The amount was uh, that the amount inputted from Mr. Hutchins for the 1935 MPT was five hundred and fifteen thousand five hundred and seventeen dollars. The significance of this for your argument is an example of the, uh, it's an example of a difference in approaches. Yes, um, and we'll also lead to a couple other things that I, I hope to get to. It's it's one of it's one example of a difference in their approaches. What it changes, and it it might be a wrong way to look at it. Might be a right way to look at it. But what is the consequence of this difference? Are you talking about in dollar dollar amounts? Either a dollar or or some other consequence. The consequence is that throughout the entire process, uh, professors Bowie and Smart were consistent in their approach, not just substituting figures when they had oh, actual It's an records. example of consistency. And, and, the, and the principle itself. And the principle. Applying the principle. And do you say it has any consequence? Well, this you chose one of many. You say this one has a consequence. And uh, the, the number you told me was? 515,000. 515,000. So do you say that the significance is 515,000 brought to present value, that that's, that that's the consequence? Or are there, other, are there some other consequences? Uh, the consequences are more uh, as an example of the principles and how the experts approached it. The actual dollar figure, that we're talking about, the 515, that's province-wide. So it'll be further portioned on in later steps. Oh, right. And then brought forward in the present value calculations.
So with this disagreement, Mr. Hutchins responds on this issue, and that's at tab six. <clears throat> which is from the expert reply report of David Hutchings, Exhibit 10, paragraph 55. And in the second sentence, I'm gonna read from, he responds, while they are correct that no MPT is recorded in the OPAs for the 1935 fiscal year, they provide no evidence that affirmatively states that there was no MPT collected by the Crown in this, in that period. So the MPT remains a disputed item to today. The plaintiffs consider this a mistake of Bodwain Smart for not imputing an amount. When we submit that the evidence shows the mistake was on Mr. Hutchins' part. In oral submissions last week, the plaintiff's counsel addressed the issue of the MPT and made two submissions to the court. And this is on September 11th, page 85, line 22. His first submission was that the amount in question was small. And Ontario admits that it is relatively small compared to the amounts in question, like the $126 billion being claimed. But again, it serves as a good example. What do you say to that submission? The amount was small. Uh, like I said, it, we admit that it is relatively small compared to the amounts in question in this litigation. Now, the second submission was a little more concerning. <clears throat> they submitted that when Professor Smart explained the error of Hutchings, that SMART expressed the amount of the invented MPT in present value province-wide figures instead of breaking it down to the RST area. This was argued as some sort of improper step or advocacy by Professor SMART. This submission is without merit and unfounded. First, has mentioned the figures the experts were working with through this working with through this process were province-wide amounts that later on had to be apportioned to the RST area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second, if we consider what amount the professor would have brought forward, we can see that <clears throat> at tab seven of the Ontario Compendium. <clears throat> and what we have at tab seven, at page 10 of Ontario Compendium, is page 219 of the Hutchings Demonstrative, which was exhibit 11. And here we can see the amount that Mr. Hutchings inputted, 515517. And not surprisingly, he used a province-wide figure. And that would have been the figure that Michael Smart presumably just brought forward. There's nothing untoward about, untoward about Professor Smart using Mr. Hutchins figure and to bring it at the present value. I might have missed that. You say ultimately, Professor Smart used Mr. Hutchings' figure. Professor Smart expressed the amount in present day value. And which amount, the province wide? It would have been the 515. Which was the province wide? It's province wide, Your Honor. And is that the figure that Mr. Hutchings attributed to the 1935 mining profit tax? Yes, this is his slide, and that's the number he's explaining that he inputted. 
Thank you. Now, you can contrast this with another example of the approach taken by the plaintiff's expert, and that'll be at tab eight of the Ontario Compendium. This slide, which is 211 from exhibit 11, Mr. Hutchins' demonstrative, was presented to the court in oral submissions by plaintiff's counsel. And in it, Mr. Hutchins is purporting to demonstrate how small the difference is in the critiques of Baldwin Smart to his amounts. The problem is what Mr. Hutchins has done, he's aggregated nominal amounts. And I know Ms. Evans spoke about this last week in her submissions. Every economic expert agreed that a dollar in the past is worth more today. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So when you look at these items in rows two, three, four, five, and six, because of the time pairs they spanned, the dollars that are older would be worth much more. This is one of the reasons why Bodeway and Smart expressed their comparison charts in present value figures, apples to apples. So when you simply add up the nominal amounts here, and then compare it as a percentage, as you see in the last column, it's simply uh, misleading. It doesn't give you an accurate picture. You're suggesting that they should have taken, they should have figured out the present value of these nominal uh, amounts for the purpose, for the purpose of this comparison. That's correct. If they wanted to do this type of comparison, they need to um, adjust the nominal values properly. Here, they didn't do that. But there's, there's nothing misleading about this, right? Well, it's all nominal values. Right, but you can't just add them up. There's a danger in that. It doesn't give you the right picture. Okay. So if you just take, for example, uh, row four, land agent salaries from 1850 to 1897. Yes. If you add them all up, <clears throat> they have a nominal amount of 1,043.30 millions, billion dollars. But obviously the dollars from 1850 would have been worth a lot more. So this amount would be greater, much greater. This was the subject of a lengthy exam of Professor Smart by Mr. Lipton. And behind this slide at page 12, I've included an excerpt from the transcript where he explains the problem. So the, the criticism is adding them up and suggesting that the added up figure is misleading. Yes. And they go one step further. They express it as an impact in percentages. So the aggregation is misleading. And then they go again to try to show how small the difference is. And again, it just compounds the problem. Okay. And if the court was trying to understand the evidence of Mr. Hutchinson's and noticed that the nominal values were in terms of a thousand dollars in different years at different times, do I even need to look at 
I don't know why. You say it's added up. You say at the bottom it's added up, but how could that be an addition if it's still 1,043? Right, so that 1,043. One second. Sorry, the, the actual amounts are in the next column, impact. And they're adjusting the total nominal amount based on those. Right, but, but if, to, the, if the purpose of the evidence was to show, you're, you're saying by not bringing forward and giving present value amount for the differences. That's what each of each of the, the items, the, the 1043 figure is, well, I, I don't even think I know what it is anymore, but 1043 is what? 1043, nine. Oh, it's in millions. In, that's, it's 1.043. Right is Hutchings our NCRR as of January 24th, 2023. So what he's done, if you look at row two, and if you look at the impact number 0.53, and that's expressed in millions, he's adjusting his total by that impact. But the impact again is an aggregated nominal figure. Do you say it is always an error to look at nominal values when one looks at, let's say, 1850 to 1897? No, but when you're comparing nominal values across different time periods, that's when you have the problem. Because a dollar in 1850 is worth a lot more than one in 2019. So when you just simply add them up, you're not getting an accurate picture. All right, well, let's not add them up. Let's just look at what what is in you used um number four land agent salaries right and so what the impact is 0 0.01 i don't know what that is dollars in millions expressed in, in millions. millions that's correct right 0 0.01 do you dispute that number well no th that what that is is the aggregated nominal values of that item <laughs> across that period, which is okay. 40, 47 years. Okay, so you, you agree that 0 0.01 properly reflects the difference that Mr. Hutchings is trying to show as impact? No, it's just nominal dollars over almost five decades. Okay. So it doesn't give you a proper impact, uh, improper picture of the value of those dollars. So you say the impact column is unhelpful. That's correct. And therefore the percentage impact number is unhelpful. That's correct. And you say that the impact column is unhelpful because it wasn't brought forward. You're comparing dollars from different periods that should have different values. And that's not reflected in these calculations. And when I framed it as it's unhelpful because it wasn't in, in present value dollars, you gave me a different answer. So do I have that, have I misstated it? I said it's unhelpful because it wasn't brought forward. I could ask, is it unhelpful because it wasn't in present value figures? And your answer is you're comparing dollars from different periods that should have different values. That's not reflected. So is my understanding of it wrong, what you're saying? No, let me, let me clarify my answer to respond to your question. If you're gonna do these types of comparisons, you should be using present value figures. 
And that will be the apples to apples comparisons. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna let the economists explain this better than I can. <clears throat> On the next page was the exchange with Professor Smart. And this is the day 35 transcripts, page 6115. I'm just gonna read his first paragraph answer at the top there, line three. <clears throat> Absolutely. You just can't do this exercise with nominal values. Looking at nominal values here is deceptive. It's not informative in two distinct ways. The first is the numbers look small. Whereas from a present day perspective, those small numbers were big to them, right? Including interest, they turn into big numbers. So everything turns into big numbers. That's right, but- We all know that. And I'm not gonna remember any of these numbers, nor be persuaded in any way by them. Isn't the example that, that he's trying to show is that even at the time, these were small numbers, these were small impacts, and we all know that ultimately the small numbers become very big numbers? The problem is that he's comparing those <clears throat> small- but, but what, what, if I'm not in, what if I'm not fixed on the actual number? I'm fixed on the- the, the quality of the criticism, that it's not precise. It's not precise. Okay. And is there a criticism that, it, that the point he was trying to make was that these, that these were relatively small impacts? That is the point he was trying to make. And does, does Professor Smart challenge that, that they were not relatively small impacts? Or does he just say it's imprecise? It's not the right way to do it. The answer to that question is on page 14. Okay. <clears throat> Your Honor asked him the question, would it be too trite to say that what you're saying is by using nominal values, any conclusion with respect to the impact, any conclusion on impact is meaningless. Yes, I do believe that. So it doesn't. Oh. I did find, as you might have known at the time, that Professor Smart was um, seemed likely to take very strong positions. Possibly, my question invited that. Uh, I can't remember the exact circumstances happening at the question, but um, the answer <clears throat> in our submission would be still valid. Okay, but you you say. You take the position today. You're telling me that the criticism that Smart launched at Hutchings, or sorry, the criticism that Hutchings launched was that these items that were pointed out had relatively small impact. And he, uh, in support of that position, he created a chart. Mr. Hutchings. Mr. Hutchings did. Yes. In support of his position. And Mr. and Professor Smart took a look at that chart and said, wrong way to do it. It's deceptive. Because you haven't brought them, you haven't used present value dollars, you haven't compared apples to apples. Yes. And one conclusion we can come to for sure is that the precise impact is not before us. Yes. But do you say now that that the point being made is that these errors constituted relatively small impact. It was a wrong opinion. Well, the point I was going to get to is that the court should use caution when presented with nominal values in aggregate form or other calculations are based on them because we don't know. <clears throat> It's a complex process to bring present value figure to bring nominal value figures forward from different time areas. And you the, don't think that the court is going to engage in any calculations, do you? Any of I these calculations that you have said are so spectacularly complicated. For instance, bringing forward, needing 
I don't even know what they are. Some kind of formula to do it on a year by year basis. You don't, you're not anticipating that that is what the court will engage in. No, no. So what that is caution, I think you're, you're safe on that. The caution isn't to do the calculations. The caution is be careful of relying upon charts like these. So what are the takeaways from the MPT 1935? We just talked about one. Please use caution when presented with these kinds of comparisons and aggregate numbers. There are no MPT revenues for 1935. This demonstrates Professor Boldway and Smarts applying their approach to the use and reliance on data. In this situation, there was a rational explanation to support the PAOs as well. Mr. Hutchins' approach did not rely on the data. It deviated from it by inputting a revenue figure for what he thought should be there, and then including it in his NCRR totals. It also demonstrated his response to professors Bowie and Smart, requiring them to an unfair standard to prove a negative, to basically prove it didn't happen. And the implication that was left by the plaintiffs that they're trying to assert that somehow professor Smart acted improperly by using province-wide figures is unfounded. Unless the court has any other further questions about the NPT 1935, I'll move on to the next example. Thank you. And that is the hydro expenses. This is addressed at paragraph 110 of Ontario reply submissions. Now I will be honest, I found the plaintiff's submissions on this point a little confusing to me. At paragraph 443 of their <coughs> excuse me, main submissions, they appear to be portraying the lack of hydro expenses by Goldwayne Smart as some sort of error. And in, in oral submissions, they cited the hydro expenses as some sort of example of the failure of Goldwayne Smart to adhere to their approach to data where it suited their purposes. They say, when you say in oral submissions, they cited the hydro expenses as an example of. Oh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> they also argued that Mr. Hamill was, was in some sort of conflict or contradicted bold way, smart, bold way and smart on this issue. None of these arguments are true. In fact, the hydro expenses is another good example of the principled approach taken by Boldway and Smart on the reliance and use of data. The court pointed this out to the plaintiff's counsel last week, page 50 on the transcripts, day 59 at lines five to eight. Mr. Schachter's response was that when it suited their purposes, that was my point. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, when it suits their theory. <clears throat> I 
I'm going to first address the assertion that Ontario witnesses were in conflict. As I said, this is false. Cliff Hamill did not contradict Professors Bodeway and Smart. And if you turn to tab nine of my compendium, page 21, <clears throat> this is the report of Cliff Hamill. I neglected to add the exhibit number. I'll get that at the break. Oh, that's fine, thank you. I've highlighted paragraph 106. I don't intend to read it, but what he indicates in there, as you can see, he states he has not identified any specific expenses incurred by the province in support of the water rental revenues. Five lines from the bottom, he also puts in the parentheses and is not supported by records from the POA. He also says the 2% assumption is not unreasonable. He does not oppose its use. So that was his position. You turn to the next tab, tab 10, page 22. <clears throat> this is from the report of Bodwain Smart. At paragraph 83, exhibit 60. Oh, sorry, this is the nominal values report of Boldway and Smart. The professors say, likewise, the plaintiff's experts deduct 2% of water rental revenues as hydroelectricity related expenses. Tab 10, page 22, Your Honor. Yes, I'm just, I was just trying to remind myself, who's, whose document is this? So this is from the Bodeway and Smart Nominal Values Report. <clears throat> and that's Exhibit 60. All right, thank you. Continue. The second sentence of that paragraph says, but the PAO in fact include no specific expenses associated with generating water rentals. Consistent with our approach of relying on the PAO, we therefore deduct nothing for water rental expenses. There is no conflict here. I, I'm I, I don't need to hear you much. You, you say it's not a conflict. Plaint or Ontario has an expert that says 2% is not unreasonable. Bodeway and Smart say we're sticking with our method. It's not in the PAO, we're not using it. Right, and Mr. Ham also said there's nothing in the PAO either. Yeah, he said it's not, yeah, that, there's no, there's no uh, conflict there. They say it's, un it's reasonable, it's not unreasonable. I'm not sure if he said it was reasonable. He said it's not unreasonable. Right. So what can we take away from the hydroelectricity ex expenses? Another example, Professors Bodwain Smart being consistent in their application of the principle of the use and reliance on data. In this case, there were no hydro expenses in the PAOs so they included none. Having no actual data, Hutchins proceeded to once again input his own data for this item. Any allegation that Baldwin Smart changed the principle to suit their needs, needs is unfounded. And as independent experts, they had no particular needs. But in this case, the exclusion of hydro expenses only results in increased NCRRs and lower expenses to the detriment of Ontario. This is another example of the errors being alleged against Professor Bodeway and Smart, where in fact, it is not an error.
subject to any questions on the hydro expenses, I'd like to move on to the next example, <clears throat> which is the post-1945 expenses. Now, this is the most significant example I want to address on this principle. We submit it was an extraordinary decision made by Mr. Hutchings and it had the largest value impact on his NCRR calculation. Professors Bodway and Smart were consistent in their application of their approach of using PAO data for the entire period in question, 1850, to the end of 2019. They continue to use the accounts, public accounts, and make their appropriate calculations for NCRR. But as we know, after 1945, Mr. Hutchins changes his approach and inputs expense data for the next 70 years by applying a fixed expense ratio. This was addressed in the Ontario main submissions at paragraphs 198 to 206. Now, I don't intend to repeat Ontario's written submissions on this issue. I'm just gonna quickly highlight some points on this topic. <clears throat> the first of which is that Hutchings after post-1945 no longer uses any expense data aside from spectrum. Now, what does that mean? He's not taking expense data after 1945 and making any apportionments. He's not looking at any trends. He's not including items that he previously included pre-1945, he does not account for any new expense items or expense items that grew rapidly post-1945. Things such as mine rehabilitation, which is part of the cost of extraction before 1945, and of course, reforestation expenses, which also related to stumpage before 1945 and after. So both mining rehabilitation and, what's it called? Reforestation. And reforestation were expenses pre-1945. Uh, this is from the Bodeway Smart Nominal Values Report. And they explain that the cost of mine rehabilitation is part of the original extraction. So when you extract the mine, there's still a leftover cost to do. And when it falls past 1945, it's not taken into account by Mr. Hutchins. Okay. Was it taken into account pre-1945? No. So let, let, I'm just going to try and understand your words. Mr. Hutchings does not account for any new expenses or expenses that grew rapidly. That's right. After 1945, for example, mine rehabilitation. Then you say, which... is part of the cost of extraction before 1945. Yes. It's booked as, or it's recorded as part of the cost of extraction before 1945. I don't, like, know. I, I don't know what you're saying about it. It's, is it conceptually part of the cost of extraction and, who, and who's counting cost of extraction? Is, was it considered an expense? I, I, I'm just not sure what the point is. It's considered an expense on the Ontario books. <clears throat> but okay. It's not specifically, it doesn't say this relates to extraction in 1926. It's not, it's not labeled like that. It's not? No. Mining rehabilitation. Mining rehabilitation, but it, it doesn't say um, this is for ABC mine 
you know. Okay, but but there's just mining rehabilitation expenses. That's correct. Is an expense pre 1945. Pre and post. On the books on PAO data. Is there an expense for mining rehabilitation? Yes. Okay. So therefore, when calculating a ratio, the ratio would have included consideration of, or as I understand, pre-1945 expenses. Well, that is an excellent assumption, but Mr. Hutchins did not include that cost. He didn't include it where? In calculating his trend line or his ratio? That's correct. We know, and he, doesn't he didn't consider it an ex um, in his categories of relevant expenses. He didn't consider it his category of relevant expenses because um, or sorry, but it would have been in his calculation of the ratio. What no. would have been considered in that? No, his, his ratio is based on his expenses. Um, so anything he excluded pre-1945 would not be part of that. So he, so Mr. Hutchings did not consider it an expense pre-1945. Under his rules of expenses, okay. he did not. So he was consistent then. He didn't consider an expense pre-1945. He didn't consider, for the same reasons, presumably he doesn't consider it an expense after 1945. Consistently wrong. Okay, but it, it's not that he missed it. That's right. My point he, was that- he, he kept it out because he, he I, I don't remember the reason, but he kept it out. Right. Okay. So how is that related to using the percentage? Are you that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh, the, apply, the, the criticism here is that Mr. Hutchings applied a fixed expense ratio. Yes. For that period. He no longer used any expense data. Yes. As an example, mining rehabilitation. Yes, but the specific. But in fact, he never, he didn't for some reasons that have to do with his understanding of expenses and, and uh, matching, he did not include ex mining rehabilitation expenses before either. Right. Okay, so. so there are two complaints and you've, you've touched on the second one, but I wanna clarify the one we're talking about right now is that there are things that change post 1945. Yeah. And it, that includes increased cost for things such as reforestation and mine rehabilitation. And he doesn't take that into account. So the t he, he is not taking into account trends, even though on a principled basis, he thinks mining rehabilitation expenses don't belong as an expense. Right. Okay. So the, so the size of the number is not what is um, determinative of his matching. I'm not sure I understand it's, that question. It's, Whatever he saw pre-1945 for mine rehab expenses, whatever that number was, let's say it's $100. Okay. Mr. You're saying Mr. Hutchings did not include that as an appropriate expense. That's correct. And post-1945 as well, he did not include it as an appropriate expense. And it may have been instead of $100 a year, it may have been a million dollars a year because it increased. Right, he didn't include any expenses. Right, okay. Post-1945. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm just gonna give you the site for the nominal values report. Goldwing Smart Nominal Values Report, Section 8.2, Exhibit 60. That's what talks about the extraction cost, increased cost. I know it's <clears throat> the increased extraction cost. 
It's 1120. It's probably a good time for a break, Your Honor. How are you doing? Have I interrupted you so much? You're off here. <laughs> I'm a little behind, but I think I could make it up. I'll try. Let's try that. Thank you. Thank you. This court is to down for 15 minutes. Order, all rise. <clears throat> Support is resumed. Please be seated. When you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. I apologize for my voice. This magical storm must have clogged me up. It's not COVID. <laughs> so the pen up, uh, the ultimate point from the last section was that post 1945. Mr. Hutchins' expense values, his ratio, is now based entirely on direct crown revenue figures. If the revenue figures go up, 31.9% portion goes up. If they go down, the same. He is no longer considering relevant expenses under the amended order. It's all tied to revenues. So my second point <clears throat> is the magnitude of this decision. Mr. Hutchins himself expressed this change to the ratio as 72.9% of the difference between his nominal NCRR amounts and professors Boldway and Smart. And that's from exhibit 11, Hutchings demonstrative, slide 186. But again, this was an aggregated number of nominal amounts. So we can't rely on the pre precision of that number. Needless to say, all experts agreed that decision to go with the expense ratio had a massive impact. And that massive impact is 72.9% of the difference. He expressed between this. the two sets of experts. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that last part, Your Honor. It's 72.9% of the difference between the two experts. That's how he expressed it. He also gave a dollar figure to that, but again, that's nominal dollars, and it was 2.12 billion. Thank you. Third point is timing. The timing of this change comes at a critical time that favors the plaintiffs greatly. The court heard evidence that post-1945, Crown resource revenues would start to fall and Crown expenditures would increase in the, in the resource sectors. Professor Smart testified that this trend in crown resource revenues and expenses could be explained by three things. One, the depletion of resource stocks in the territory. Two, the decline in real resource prices due to competition. And three, the rise in forest regeneration expenses.
And that is from the examination chief, uh, Professor Smart, May 17th, 2023, day 34. Pages 5889 to 5891. As well as 5889 59. 5889 to 5891. Thank you. As well as exhibit 70, smart demonstratives at page 18. Let me just catch up for one moment. Of course. During the course of this trial, the court was presented with other documentary evidence indicating significant change in the forest industry. I've attached two documents, one at tabs 11 and one at tabs 12, that talk about a reorganization in the program, as well as the critical need for more personnel. And I'll just take you to tab 11, which is <clears throat> at page 23, Ontario Compendium. It's the Ontario Royal Commission on Forestry, 1947. On the page 24, I've highlighted a passage at the bottom of the page. And I'll just read that out. Unless we are willing to spend the money necessary to employ three or four times the present numbers of foresters and other technical personnel, including rangers, scout scalers, etc., forestry and the maintenance of forest in this province will continue to deteriorate because present staffs are totally inadequate for inspections and control. In a decade or two, forest industries will begin to shrink with consequent distress to the com communities concerned. Loss of revenue and a general, bless you, and a general weakening of the economic fabric of the province. As indicated in paragraph 203 of Ontario main submissions, the PAO data shows that beginning in the 1960s, the Crown incurred significant sustained losses, resulting largely from forestry expenditures. And it cites to the SMART examination chief, but I've given you the paragraph number, so. Now, on the issue of rising cost in the forest industry, <clears throat> the plaintiffs make a very odd argument in the reply closing submissions. I'm gonna to turn to paragraphs 86 and 87 of the group of fives reply closing submissions.
At paragraph 86, they argue, uh, this is on page 17 of their <clears throat> submissions. And 86 reads, as for the argument that there was a steady rise in expenses from 1919 to 1945, that simply is not what the evidence held. 87. As the data shows, in the 26 years from 1919 to 1945, the expense to revenue ratio increased in 15 years and decreased in 11 years. That is, in 42% of the years that Ontario points to, there was a year-over-year -year decrease in the ratio of expenses to revenues. This is not rising steadily. I'll be honest, Your Honor, I've never seen this kind of analysis before. I've never seen anyone count the ups and downs on a chart and compare them and conclude a lack of a trend. Anyone who's ever lost money on the stock market, and that's me, <laughs> would know it's not the number of ups and downs that tells you anything, but the magnitude of the ups and downs and the trend line. Like the previous example at tab eight, when the plaintiff expert was trying to downplay the effect of expenses he excluded, this calculation provides no assistance to the court whatsoever. <clears throat> you would never look at your bank account statement, count the number of deposits in a month and the number of withdrawals in a month and conclude you're doing fine. That makes no sense. Now I can tie this to actual figures. If you go to tab 16 of the Ontario Compendium, <clears throat> now my friend had referred to this in his compendium last week, but it's from exhibit H for the cross-examination of David Hutchings. At table A1, this comes from Mr. Uh, on page 44 at Ontario. tab 16. Thank you. On table A1 on page 44, these expense uh, expense percentages as a percentage of revenues all comes, all these numbers come from Mr. Hutchings' work papers, table 15C. So what I wanna direct the court's attention to is on page 45A. Wait, who created this chart again? So this was Ms. Gaggy. And she took the numbers from uh, Mr. Hutchings' work papers, uh, Ontario Council. Thank you. If you go to page 45A. Yes. Table D1. This shows the annual growth rate between years of 1935 and 1945. Now, setting aside the 35 year, because we know that it was a shortened year. Just ignore that first number on the last column under annual growth rate. If you go to 1937, that shows how expenses grew from 1936 to 1937. And these are Hutchins expense numbers. <clears throat> so as you can see, for that year, it grew 78%. The next year, it dropped 7%. The year after, it grew by 2%. And then in 1940, 3%. 1941, 31%. And then it drops the next three years by 7%, 6%, 8%. percent it increases 
As you can see, if you just counted the number of negatives and number of positives, it would not give you an accurate picture because the growth years contain much larger jumps. Calculation provided by my friend in submissions uh, cannot provide any useful information to the court. My next point was that Mr. Hutchings was incorrect in his assumption about basic organization. Basic organization is not overhead. And I'm not going to read it out, but this is explained at paragraph 199 of Ontario main submissions. It was basically the Department of Land and Forest decentralized forest management activities. And Mr. Hutchins had assumed it was overhead. My next point, that there is sufficient detail in the public accounts and annual reports to identify relevant expenses post-1945. This is explained in the Bold Way and Smart Nominal Values Report, section 8.2. And in the slides I've attached as tab 13 in the Ontario Compendium of Exhibit 70. You may not have remembered, but I took Mr. Hutchings to a number of annual reports on, during the cross-examination. What we saw in those reports was a wealth of information about program spending. We saw details such as personnel records, the number of people working in different offices, how many retired, grants being issued, the number of wolf bounties paid, my favorite. We also saw records of the number of trees being planted, the length of fire hoses in different offices, and many other details about forest management and departmental spending. Now, despite this, Mr. Hutchins maintains that he needed more information to satisfy his approach to classifying expenses. However, Ontario's experts were able to use this wealth of, wealth of information to do their work and calculate expenses. And this was also done by a third party. We heard evidence. What does that mean? This was also done by a third party. Uh, after the completion of the reports, Professor Smart discovered the 1975 task force report. This was referred to last week by my friend as well. Yes. So they conducted a similar exercise and were able to put together the same kind of expense calculation that Professor Baldwin Smart did. The complaint raised by plaintiff's counsel. Sorry, is, should I just presume that the task force used the PAO? I'm sorry, I missed that. Should I just presume that the task force used the data from the provincial account? Yes, and the annual reports. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Mr. Lipton 
wants me to clarify, they did use that, the PAOs and annual reports, not presumed. Oh. So if you go to page 34 of the Ontario Compendium, <clears throat> and this is tab 13, This is page 68 from Exhibit 70, Michael Smart's Demonstratives, where he talks about the work of the task force, the 1975 task force. Uh, page 34 is on the screen. Is that where you're directing me? Yes. Thank you. And what Professor Smart did, he compared the to his totals versus the task force totals of the forestry expenses for the years 1966 through 1974. <coughs> and he noted that they were different. He put percentages on the bottom row. You can see the 14, 17, 14, 20%. And he explained there was a different allocation of, I think he would call them administrative expenses, but we'll get to that. If you go forward in the same tab to pay, uh, page 38, these are where those totals came from, pages 38 and 39. And you can see there identifiable expense categories and their related expenses. Now, last week, when my friend brought your attention to the task force report, you used the phrase, you thought this was in collaboration with? Yes. And that, that is a perfectly, um, accurate description with the forest industry. But, uh, is it a perfectly accurate recollection of the evidence? Yes. Okay. And if you remember, my friend took you to another page where they, I guess, negotiated, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, fractions of those costs to apportion or sign to the forest industry, which were obviously lower. Well, negotiated may be your word. If yeah. you have evidence that it was negotiated or they worked in collaboration? Yes, I, I didn't mean to okay. miss anything. So they come, came to, um, I guess, apportionment. They yeah, they collaborated and came to um, an apportionment number. And then my friend, compared those new apportion numbers to Professor Bodeway, uh, Professor Bodeway and Smart's totals and expressed that in percentage differences. Again, that's not apples to apples. He was using totals. However, in any event, <clears throat> Professor Smart did give evidence that if you, even if you remove 50% of the difference between his forest management expenses after 1945, the NCRRs in the RST territory would still amount to a net loss of over $1.6 billion. And that's referred to in the Ontario Maine submissions at paragraph 203. And in Exhibit 70, page 147. But the most important point about the task force report is that it demonstrates that forestry expenses 
can be identified in the public council annual reports. Do I recall correctly that the forest management report was uh, disclosed after the main uh, data transfer? Um, or am I, I is, am I thinking of something else? It was discovered by Professor Smart um, in preparation of his testimony after the reports had been exchanged. Is that what you mean by data transfer? Yes. Okay, yes. <clears throat> Just to be clear, I thought the evidence was it was discovered as he was preparing for his testimony after Mr. Hutchins and Mr. Stiglitz had left the stand in terms of time. That's, that, that's sort of my recollection, but we can check. That's That sounds right. I, I just can't say for sure. Okay. Thank you. Let me catch up, please. Of course. Go ahead. Well, for my next point, Ontario says submits that the 31.9% ratio is unreliable. In addition to being unwarranted. And our argument on this is found at paragraphs 198 to 206 of Ontario main submissions. We, are, we say it's not reflective of post-1945 expenses, that he made assumptions about overhead expenses that were incorrect, and that other items that he improperly excluded prior to 1945 are not reflected in that ratio. Things such as road and railway expenses, fire protection, as well as overcounting the NPT 1935. Any error pre-1945 is carried forward by the inaccurate ratio and then magnified and multiplied for the next 70 years. Mr. Hutchings also fails to follow his own practice when he chose the 31.9% ratio. I cross-examined him on the numerous interpolations he listed at paragraphs 47 and 62 of his January 31st, 2022 report. The transcript reference is day 10 at pages 1636 to 1640. In those interpolations, he used the years closest to the gap that he was trying to fill in. This was compiled into a list at tab 27 of exhibit H. At page 1638 of the transcript, lines 13 to 24, Mr. Hutchings admitted that he chose the closest years to the gaps because that was the most reliable indicator of what was missing. And that approach makes sense. Closest years to the gap should be 
a good indicator of the missing data. Yes, but for his most important interpolation, which is the post-1945 expenses, he doesn't follow this approach. And he goes with an average of all the years back to 1898. Now, does that make a difference? If you go to tab 16 of the Ontario Compendium, page 44. Table A2, it's on the right side. <clears throat> These are calculations of expense ratios as percentage of revenues. As you can see, if you use Mr. Haichin's work paper numbers, his ratio from 1898 to 1945 shows up as 31.4. Now, this was later changed at trial to 31.9 due to adjustments. Yes. If you use the year closest to the gap, which is 1945, the expense ratio would have automatically jumped up to 49.1. If you use the five years leading up to the 1945 year, it would have been 46.9%. And if you had gone back all the way to 1850, the expense ratio would have been 100.1%. So of these options, Mr. Hutchins chose the lowest one and it didn't include years closest to the gap. If he had followed his own principle, the expense ratio would have been significantly higher, but still unjustified. You say if he'd followed his own principle, it would have been 49.1. If you look at all the examples um, from the exhibit H, some years he uses one or two years. Some, sometimes he uses three years before the gap and three years after. There was one year where he only used one year. So it did vary, but they were all close to the gap. So if he had used the one year method, it would have been 49.1. If he had used the five years, it would have been 46.9 on his own numbers. Thank you. Finally, by using the expense ratio, he's essentially rendered meaningless the without loss provision in the amended order. Hutchins has locked revenues at a net 68.1% positive NCRRs post-1945. Amended judgment. Yes, uh, did, I, did I misstate that? Yeah. And this is detailed in paragraph 501 of the Ontario Main Submissions. And here's where we come across the second odd argument from the plaintiffs. I'm gonna go back to the reply closing submissions of the group of five plaintiffs. If you 
If you go to page 16, at paragraph 78 and 79, They assert that by using an average, well, I'm just going to read it so I won't, so I don't misquote them. <clears throat> In 78, they say the proposition that Hachim's approach reads out the treaty bargain without incurring loss provision of the treaty is actually a logical assertion. This is because necessarily implicit in Hachim's use of the 31.9% ratio is that on average over the years, revenues exceeded expenses. Stating that on average, there's a positive result does not prohibit that in absolute terms, some years may have been negative and some years positive. It simply means that on average, the result ends up being on the positive side. That is the nature of averages. I'll admit again, this one is also confusing to me. The fact that you lock revenues at 68.1% means you cannot have a loss. The fact that it's an average over a period prior fails as a response both logically and statistically. Logically, imagine if you go to a casino and you sit down at a game. Every play costs you $100 and the dealer gives you $39.10 back continuously. Of course, you're going to say, I can't win. The response is not from the dealer. Well, that's the average um, return of the last 100 customers. If you can't win more than that, you cannot have that loss. Or statistically, imagine if that game was to roll a six out of die. If you roll a six, you win. That gives you a one in six chance of winning the game and you have one in six chance of rolling any other number, the average roll is three. Now imagine if the casino now fixes the result, gives you a dice with only threes on it. Every side is a three. As soon as they fix that number, your chance of rolling a six is zero. Your chance of rolling a one is zero. By fixing that percentage, the other scenarios are gone. And that's what happens when you fix the expense ratio, there can no longer be a loss. And it negates the without loss provision in the amended court of appeal order. What if the exercise is not to predict what one roll of the dice will give you? but it's to calculate or try to assess compensation over 170 years. Isn't that more like the eight people at the table or the hundred past customers? So that would represent, I guess, yeah, average returns over a large number. Doesn't the house but and the casino do that exact thing? I'm sure their insurers do. Well, they have to pay. They have to. They have to pay the staff. They have to stock the bar. They have to buy the chips and chocolate bars. That's right. They need to know how much money they have. That's so true. they estimate the returns, not on a per customer per throw basis. Yeah, but built into that is the possibility that some people will win and some people will lose big. When you fix it, if everybody that comes in the door only gets that set percentage, you take away those chances. 
but they don't do that. That's not what the casino is doing. They don't care who wins and loses, who wins. But say you win and Ms. Barkley loses. That's right. They still need 68% to return to run the house. Yeah. Right. Or to return. That's right. So over so time, if they're, they're just trying to estimate it. Isn't that, isn't that what the exercise was? No, because they're responding to the, the assertion that by fixing it, you cannot uh, win above that number, whatever that number is. In this case, it's uh, 31.9. You may come up to the same average over a long period of time, but mm -hmm. by doing that, there is no more winning, losing beyond that number. And to do that, that means the, that part of the order is no longer operative. The order basically says your NCRRs are 68.1% um, of revenues every year. It, it is, it's not the order, it's, it changes. So the Crown can no longer um, have a loss. For those years. For whatever year that you apply this ratio to. Post-1945. That's correct. So the takeaways from this example, again, Goldway and Smart were consistent in their approach on the use and reliance of data. They didn't stop using it after 1945. Mr. Hutchins stops relying on any expense data, save spectrum, after 1945. And he inputs seven decades based solely on revenue figures. Ontario also submits that the use of the expense ratio is unjustified and unnecessary. It ignores the evidence on expenses post-1945. And as I mentioned, the expense ratio writes out the without loss provision of the core repeal amended order. Even if one were to use an expense ratio, the flaws in how it was calculated by Mr. Hutchings means the court should treat it as unreliable for the purposes of determining augmented annuities under the treaty. Especially given this magnitude of the effect. So the principle of reliance and use of data, we say is an important principle that has been consistently and logically applied by professors Bodeway and Smart. By adhering to this principle, they have avoided, I'm gonna use their word, inventing their own data where possible, avoided subjective elements, where they would substitute data for what they believe should be there in its place. Their results are more reliable. You, um, following the um, arguments or the opinions of your expert, you place a very high value on consistency. And I would say the debate is possibly between pure consistency, that that is a value in and of itself, and bringing a high level of skill and experience to an analysis and saying that consistency doesn't work anymore. You say, I, I think that's the debate, isn't it? Mr. Hutchings says, I was happy to use 
PAO data to a certain point. But there was a point when, after I did the analysis, I said it wasn't correct. That's his position. Yep, that's right. And Bodway and Smart say POA data was created for a purpose. No one is saying that any of the inputs are incorrect. And we started with an approach and we're going to use it. That's right. So it's not a 100% you know, strict rule, but you can see examples where um, the MPT is a good example. There was a reason for it. So that added context and it supported, again, use of the, the numbers in the- I'm Mostly using the, the 1945 change right. ratio. And as you mentioned, that was triggered by what Mr. Hutchins believed is what, um, what he needed to satisfy his test. And that is uh, the subject of my next section after the lunch break. How are you doing on your uh, schedule? A um, little behind. I probably have 30 minutes in the next section. Um, so maybe 30, 40 minutes total. I, I just want to know, vis-a-vis -vis what you have uh, scheduled, how are you? I'm a little behind, probably by an hour. Okay, and by an hour? I was, yeah, I was hoping to be okay. quicker. I'm a slow reader. Okay, so where are you going next? I just want to finish my conclusions and then I think- Please go ahead. So Ontario submits that the court should prefer the evidence of professors Bowley and Smart. Their results are simply more reliable and as grounded in accurate data. And in particular, the expense ratio, expense ratio used by the plaintiffs for post-1945 expenses should be rejected. And I think that's a good time to take the lunch break. Very good. Um, let's come back at quarter to two. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Quarter, all right. This court is to down to 145. 